We're looking at 2 John this morning, 2 John. Last week, we kind of did an overview, kind of getting the perspective from our elder, and that would be John the Apostle. And this morning, we're, we'll jump into the whole letter, 13 verses, and um, entitled it, Foundations Plus, Plus Practice Equal Balance and Conviction. So before we get into God's word, let's um, bow our hearts and come before God. Father, do thank you. Thank you for ministering to our hearts through song and worship. Thank you so much just to prepare our hearts so as we open your word, our hearts will be open to you. And that God, you would sink your word as a seed, a good seed, into a heart so that we can hide your word in our hearts so we wouldn't sin against you, as King David would say. And Father, help me to decrease and you increase. Let your word be lifted up, that you be glorified, Father. And we ask this, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. John the Elder. Let me read from the New King James. Verse 1, the Elder. To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because the truth which be, abides in us and will be with us forever. Verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and the, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we receive commandment from the Father, and now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Verse 6, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. Verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and do, does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Verse 12, having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. And finally, verse 13, the children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So gang, our overview, our overview. What do we see this morning? Well, first we see our author, the elder, the apostle, right? And then we see our audience. We have a letter being written to a particular woman, a widow with children and other believers who met in her home, or you could say a home fellowship. Some commentators believe that this woman lived in Ephesus. Third thing we see is that the reason for this letter, and the reason for it was faithfulness to the truth due to concerns of teachings that she heard from some false teachers. And then belief in the truth must be lived out in our behavior and then finally, truth cannot be compromised. It must be defended. And that's the overview for 2 John. So what do we see in our first three verses? Right? The elder to the elect, chosen, lady and, and her children, right? What do we see? Well, the first thing we see, gang, we see the words elder, right? And remember last week, we looked at our kapuna with Christ, if you will, in great detail. We learned that the elder, John the Apostle, was an eyewitness, right? He was an eyewitness. He personally experienced life with our Savior for three years. He had a front row seat to all his teachings. What else? He was there when Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. He was there when Jesus blasted the religious Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and so forth. 
He saw mercy and grace in action. John saw Jesus die. He also enjoyed fellowship with the resurrected Lord. He watched Jesus ascend to heaven. And then John, he was used by our Lord to write the gospel in three letters and revelation. He also planted and pastored churches and made disciples of Christ, after Christ. You guys remember Polycarp. And the next thing we see in our first three verses in, is that John uses the word truth four times. He uses it four times. The first truth for you note takers. We see John tell this chosen lady and her children, I love in the truth. The first thing that I notice in this verse are the words chosen or elect lady. And it reminds me of Jesus' words in John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. All right? And doesn't our Lord do the same with us? He calls us. He chooses us. I've used this illustration in the past, but for me it's a flashback going back to Conway Elementary when I was there as a little guy. You guys remember the scene? You're on the playground. It's P.E. or it's recess. And then the teacher says, you're a captain and you're a captain. How many of you remember being the first kid chosen? Right? You're the first kid chosen and you're standing next to your friend and you're thinking, that's right, I was chosen first. But how many of you were the last ones chosen? Right? And you're standing there thinking, bro, the only reason you wouldn't choose me is because I was the last one and I'm on your team and you're going to make me be last for playing kickball. <laughs> right? But God's not like that. For you note takers, write this down. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world. How's that? Flashback, Genesis 1, right? When we hear God say, let there be light, and there was light. Before God did that, he chose you, and he chose me in, in eternity past. Figure that one out, that we're on his kickball team to win. Read Revelation, right? We win. We're on the winning team. But check this out. We see the apostle, right? He addresses this chosen lady and her children, selected by sovereign grace for salvation by God. He says, I love you sincerely with the love of Christ. In truth, not only I, but all those who have known the truth. Talking about other believers, right? Again, the basis for this love is because John and the other believers not only believed in the truth, but they believed in certain things, if you will, essentials that made up this truth. The first thing they believed in was the virgin birth. The second was the sinless life of Jesus. That Jesus was God who came in the flesh. That Jesus died for the sins of all humanity. And that three days later, he rose from the dead bodily and that he ascended to heaven and is coming back. And that by grace you have been saved through faith in God's one and only Son. And the last part of the truth is this, and salvation cannot be attained by works, but only by God's grace. But not only did we believe or did they believe in these essentials, but they experienced this truth in such a way that they were not bound together by some social, political, or class compatibility. No, they were bound together because of who Jesus Christ was. Let's check out verse 2. That's where we find our third truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. You see, folks, these truths were just, were, it wasn't just head knowledge, but heart knowledge, right? 
We talked about last week that the farthest distance from man is 17 inches between the head and the heart. You know, it wasn't just information that they knew, like two plus two is four, but that they knew this knowledge in such a way that it was real. It sunk down in their hearts and it changed them. And the reality is, we can say the same thing. For we also know and love this truth about Christ, and we've also experienced the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This is an amazing truth. It's factual, it's objective, but it somehow, some way, supernaturally, it gets transformed, it gets translated into in such a way where we can experience this truth. Fancy Greek word for that is gnosko. So what do we do? What do we learn in the first two, verse, two verses about truth? We see that we are chosen, like the elect or chosen lady in verse 1. There are certain truths that make up the truth that we believe in and experience as Christians. Because of these truths, we love one another with a sincere kind of a love. Let's take a look at verse 3. Our apostle writes, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. For you note-takers, see the word grace? If you want to underline that, circle that, you can write these words next to it. Next to grace, you can write divine favor. Divine favor, for that's what we, only God can give. And then underline the word, the second word is mercy. And right next to that, you can write pardon and forgiveness. Pardon and forgiveness. And then the third word I want you guys to take notice of, take notice of is the word peace. And next to that, you can write Tranquility of spirit. For you see, gang, only God can give us these beautiful things, if you will. Remember, the Apostle Paul emphasized God's grace in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And our elder, John, the Apostle, you know, he witnessed in action when Jesus healed the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. He did an act of mercy at the pool of mercy. We talked about that last week. And not only that, he not only did this act of mercy, but he did another act of mercy when he encountered the woman who was caught in adultery in chapter 8, right? The way he talked to her, the way he treated her. You know, woman, where is your accusers? Not here, sir. Go and sin the more. An act of mercy. John saw that. Then our apostle uses the word peace. And it makes me wonder if John remembers his conversation with our Lord in his gospel in John 14, 27. When he, he writes of Jesus, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's pretty cool that only God can do these things for us. The fourth truth, if you will, that John points out in Christ's equality is, excuse me, Christ's equality with God. With God the Father. And then you notice the last words in verse 3. In truth and love. In truth and love. And I believe our elder, John, wants us to remember that we have to live a life of balance between truth and love. Remember, truth without love will make us a legalistic Pharisee. And, as we would say locally, brothers, abunai, no good, cannot do that. Right? We don't want to be Pharisees. We don't want to be legalistic. But... On the other side, love without truth will lead us to compromise. And that, as well, is not where we want to be. So we got to find the, the happy medium, right? 
And in time, God teaches us, he grows us, and he shows us how to keep the balance. In regards to living in the balance, one of my favorite commentators put it this way. Now the problem is to keep truth and love in balance. This is what you see so beautifully in the Lord Jesus. He walked in truth and love. He could deal in tenderness with the destitute sinner, the outcast from society who came to him. And with a blistering word, he could scorch a Pharisee until he turned red with shame. As all the rottenness in that man's inner life was revealed, he spoke the truth and he dealt in love and he kept them in perfect balance. Jesus is our example again. Take a look at verses four to six. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is the love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Let's focus at verse 4, please. It says, I, great, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. When I read this verse and I hear it in my head, it makes me think of two things. The first is this. This is a picture of the heart of our pastor, which for me I try to follow. You know, one of the Bible teachers I enjoy, he put it this way. This is a pastor's heart, to know that his people are walking in truth. While truth is not the only concern of the pastor, it is a great concern, and it is a great comfort for a pastor to see those he loves and cares for walking in the truth. And I probably shared this with you folks in the past, but it was my privilege to serve with Pastor Tim full-time for like seven years. And, and, and the cool thing is, I spend so much time with our pastors that, you know, six days a week. And one of the things I, I, I would witness is, or see is, if you guys want to sneak in Pastor Tim's office, on the side of his desk, or it's maybe in his Bible, but he has a card that's broken down every day of the week. And he has names listed on this card, this prayer card. And he... He, he prays for us throughout the week, if you guys didn't know. And what an example, you know, for me to, to, to read this text and then for me to go, wow, I've seen our pastor do that. He cares enough to get on his knees to pray for us as a church. So I'm telling you guys the inside scoop if you didn't know, but that's our pastor. The second thing I think of when I read this verse about I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth, it, it, you know, it makes me think about now that now that I'm a parent, right? Tina and I, we got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, you know? And when I read this verse, I think, okay, if the Lord tarries, which I hope he doesn't, because... I hope we get out of here before the kids hit teenagers. But, but, but if the Lord tarries, my prayer is that Emmy and Lukey would be walking in the truth for themselves. What I mean by that is that, that they own their faith for themselves. It's not mama's faith. It's not dad's faith because dad is a pastor and so forth. But it's their faith. That they walk with God. You know, I've told my little ones that, you know what, I don't care what you do with your life as far as, uh, you know, jobs or occupations and stuff. I don't care. The only thing I care about is love God. And I think it was Augustine who said, love God with all your heart and do what you want. Sounds pretty crazy, right? But it's true. If you love God with all your heart, you will serve God. As it's just matter of fact. And for Tina and I, hopefully as the years go by, we see our kids doing that, walking with God. That would be our greatest joy. I know that. 
one of my commentators put it this way regarding verse 4. John rejoiced because when God's people are walking in truth, they also abide in God. The same idea is expressed in 1 John 2.24. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So check this out. Truth is not only important for its own sake, but also our walking in the truth Truth shows we are walking in the Lord. Okay? And the idea of walking in the truth is not taking a step or two, not breaking or leaping over a hedge to avoid, quote, sin. But it's the persistence in walking the, quote, Christian course. For you note takers, write down this song. Psalm 1. Our psalmist lays it out this way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What do we see here again? We see a progression going on. We see, do not, right, walk in the council of Bengali. Do not stand in the path of sinners. Do not have a seat with the scornful. But what does he say? Do this instead. Delight yourself in the law of the Lord. In other words, delight yourself in God's word, right? I've heard it said God is most glorified when we're most satisfied in Him. The other thing the psalmist points out is that if we delight ourselves in the Lord and meditate on His law day and night, we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What is that picture? It, it's a picture of something just solid, just sturdy, having deep roots, Right? having deep roots in such a way that when the storms come and the rain and the wind and all that chaos hits you and I, we don't move. What is that picture? You guys remember the story when Jesus is talking to the boys and he says, you know, there's two houses. One built on sand, one built on the rock. Same storm comes, same wind, same rain. One bites the dust, the other still standing. Jesus' point, do what he says. Stand on God's word. Where's your foundation? Where's my foundation? Is it on the rock of Christ or is it on the sand of this world? And if we are like this tree, as the psalmist says, planted by rivers of water, what happens? Naturally, we bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And that's something that would put a smile on God's face. And so, that's what I know I want for all of us this morning, as well as for my two cubs, you know, to stand in the truth of Christ and to walk what we read between Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, to live it. You know, be like what James would say, God, help us not to just to be hearers of the word, but doers of God's word. And that by God's spirit, he would help us do that. Let's focus our attention on the next verses, verses 5 and 6. It says, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. What we see here is that the apostle was not too proud to beg on such an important matter. He wanted our elect lady to remember that. It was essential, it was vital that in the Christian life, the commandment to love one another must be lived out. For you note takers, you want to jot down John 13, 34 to 35, and next to our next to our verse, and remember these words of our Lord, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. 
as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And what we see in this verse, we see that love is a verb. It's not feelings, it's doings, right? The stuff we do, it has to be observable. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. When I read this, it reminds me of my dad. My dad's what, 83. And growing up, not once have I ever heard my dad say, Kev, I love you. The only thing I've heard from my dad maybe four, five times, you know, when I was in a karate tournament, even if I didn't win a trophy like my brother, he'd still say I'm proud of me. Baseball, he enjoyed watching me play. Uh, win or lose, as long as I left it on the field, he'd tell me, proud of you. When I graduated from high school, I think he was just relieved that I graduated from high school. But then when I went to college and I graduated from college, it was uh, one of the only other times I heard my dad say, I'm proud of you. Which, you know, for me and my family, my mom, my sister, my brother, we never questioned if dad loved us, pop loved us. You know, my dad's thing was he showed his love by what he did, right? So I remember when I came a Christian and stuff, and I told my dad, Dad, I love you. His response to me was, really? Take out the rubbish stick. You know what's expected of you? Do it. Why should I have to sit? Okay. Uh, but my dad's point is, do it. Show it, yeah. I'm still praying for my dad that he would <laughs> come to know the Lord. He's a good man, but even my mom didn't need the Lord. And my brother and sister. But let's take a look at verses 7 to 10. 7 to 10, we're shifting gears. We're shifting gears in such a way where John is kind of getting heavy now. He's, you know the apostle of love and so forth, but now he's shifting gears. He's now warning against the wolves in sheep's clothing. He's pointing out the false teachers. Verse 7 reads, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Verse 7, talking about the deceivers, talking about those that deny or do not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You guys remember last week? John, he, he wrote this because at that time, in his time, there was a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was also, it was sweeping through the church. This was a teaching that denied the fact that Jesus was actually a man with a body. As they believed that everything material is evil and everything spiritual is good. John wanted to set the record straight on that question. And in, first, in the first verse, in 1 John chapter 1, he asserted that he had seen Jesus with his own eyes and handled him personally. Jesus was not a spirit of philosophy to John, but he is a living person who wants to have fellowship with you and me. And what else did John write in his gospel in John 1.14? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Super important verse. And in verse 7, like I said, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. What do we learn in verse 7? The first thing we learn is that false teachers were prevalent back then, as it is today as well. 
excuse me, these false teachers were smooth talking charlatans. They were imposters, they were seducers, misleading many. So at that time at the time of John's writing, right, like I said, he had the Gnostics. But today we have other heresies being peddled by other false teachers, cults, and other world religions. Okay? I know I gotta tone it down. First service I got kind of heated. And my wife asked me to push in the clutch and downshift on this part. Examples of false teachers. Examples of false teachers. I told you guys last week where there was a guy on his wife on YouTube where it was recorded where she made the statement of worship is not for God. It's for us because God is more concerned for us to be happy. And then this pastor husband of this lady is standing there saying, praise the Lord, amen. And then this church that seats 60,000 every Sunday, we're seeing the same thing. Praise the Lord, amen. The guy's name is Joe Olstein. Joe Olstein. And because of my sick personality, I labeled this guy, he's a Christianese motivational speaker. Well, that's what he is. He's not a faithful preacher, minister of the gospel. He has said some pretty crazy stuff. My wife asked me, why do you always watch him? You always get mad. <laughs> but I just want to make sure my cardiovascular system's working good. That's why I do that. No, but it, it's, it's a trip. Um, second false teacher. And, and I'm going to talk about two guys coming up because I sat under these guys teaching back in the 80s. First guy's name is Jesse Duplantis. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. He's on TBN. This guy's a flat out heretic. He shared one of these quote dreams that he had or visions that God took him to heaven. And that when he was in heaven, he was able to see God the Father, see Jesus, and then when he was in the presence of God the Father, he had the audacity to ask God, where's the Holy Spirit? Well, if I remember my Bible correctly, no man has seen God and lived. Secondly, Holy Spirit, one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is he's omnipresent. So, this guy's a flat out heretic. Did he have this vision? I don't know, maybe he had some bad chili before he went to sleep or something. But that's a name to remember. If you hear him on TV or you see him on TV, turn to the station. Third guy I'm going to talk about, his name is Harold Pittman. In the 80s when I got saved, you know, we were so excited about Jesus that, man, we could not stay away from church. We were in church like six nights out of the week and Friends would tell us, hey, we got this speaker uh, coming. You want to come check him out? And we're just like, shoots. We're there. And so we'd go. And I remember clearly this guy, older guy. He, he was telling how God gave him the ability to see demons. And he would draw, literally draw these, this is what the demons look like demon of lust and everything else in between. And when I look back, I, I would think, what? Another thing that happened is he, would, he, he told a story about how God gave him the privilege to see that the number of saints going to heaven was declining. And you know, when you're young in the Lord and stuff, you're all excited and all you're thinking is, I know I was thinking, wow, this guy must be really tapped into God, man. And then I remember giving an offering. And now when I look back, I have to watch my temper and my blood pressure because I think to myself, that guy stole my money. But the thought comes in my head as the Lord would be saying, but you gave it to me, right? Like, yeah, that's right. It's like, 
the next thought I had is, oh boy, I wouldn't want to be in that guy's shoes when he stands before the Lord. I mean, to me, because of my background now, when I look at this guy, I think that he was just clinically delusional. I mean, I just trip out. It's like, wow, false teachers. Another pair of false teachers that really hit home is because of what's been going on in Ferguson and stuff is two guys that identify themselves as reverends, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. For me, they are an embarrassment to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. When I think of them, I thought of this, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 to 19, and I believe it describes these two to a T. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are the abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. For if Jesus tells me to judge a tree by its fruit, this is the fruit that I see from these two individuals. Those are false teachers. Then John talks about in our text, he talks about Antichrist or spirit of Antichrist. And a couple of them that come to mind is if, if you guys are ever channel surfing, uh, like I was yesterday when I was going between the Oregon Ducks game and so forth, trying to follow uh, Marcus Mariota because I sure hope he gets the Heisman. But um, on Channel 5, there was this guy by the name of Apollo Quibaloy. He comes out of the Philippines. And one of the scary things, if you ever come across this guy's program, is this guy calls himself the son of God. It's his words. And I watch this and I think to myself, oh man, this guy. Caramba. Scary. You know, another antichrist that for me I think about is because I encountered him when I was on the University of Hawaii campus was, how many of you guys know who Sun Young Moon is? The Moonies. Well, Sun Young Moon, he, he believed that he was the reincarnation of Jesus, the second coming. And forgive my sarcastic humor, but I always think to myself when I remember interacting with them, I'm like, wow. So Sun Young Moon thinks he's Jesus' second coming. Sorry, I didn't know Jesus was Korean. But, <laughs> you know, but it's scary because the frightening thing, gang, is this. When I encounter these people and I interact with them, some of them are lawyers, some of them are doctors, some of them are very well educated. And I think, how can, bro? What's up? But it reminds me what the scriptures say. The God of this world has blinded their eyes so they can't believe. How real is that? I mean, that's what I see here. But take note, there is the ultimate deceiver and antichrist that is soon to be revealed. For you know, take this, write this down. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Paul writes, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits on he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse five, do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth 
and destroy it with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception, all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul is telling this, telling us that this is a future event that's going to happen. And I believe it's going to happen soon. But let's quickly look at verses 8 and 9. Our elder shouts out a warning. He says, look to yourselves or watch out that we do not lose those things we work for, but we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. One of the commentators I was reading explained these verses this way. There is nothing noble, sincere, courageous, or admirable in a false Jesus. To deny the biblical Jesus is always to reject the Father and the Son both. John here draws a critical line of truth in our own day. We must deal with modern de denials of the biblical truth, biblical Jesus with the same passion John did to in his day. Today, with our scholarly denials of Jesus and the historical record of the Gospels, it is more important than ever to know who the true Jesus is according to the Bible and to love and serve the true Jesus. And when a teaching of the Bible needs to be supplemented by some key to the Bible or by some new revelation, it is a sure sign that advanced doctrine is being put forth. Case in point, and the reason I can talk about this is for me, my two cousins are one of the leaders locally in Hawaii, with the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they used to live in the uh, Camp Forth housing where the, the headquarters was, and now they live in Brooklyn and um, serve their organization there. But what does a Jehovah's Witness do? They come to your house, they give you these magazines called the uh, Watchtower Magazines, and when you talk with them, they always have these, these books with them called the Scripture Studies. It's never just the Bible, right? It's their, quote, keys to help you and me to understand the scriptures. But the difference is the Holy Spirit dwells in you and me. He's our teacher. He gives us understanding. He leads us into all truth. He reminds us of the words of our Savior. He reminds us of the words that we read in the Bible. Scary stuff. But to look within the church as well, that... Pastor Tim and I have had to deal with in the past was there are those now called, they call themselves super apostles. See Peter Wagner and others. They consider themselves super apostles because they get new revelation of scripture. Scary stuff. But it's happening. Like I said, John had the Gnostics and others in his time. But we have our own false teachers and craziness going on today. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Check this out, gang. In reading these two verses, man, it kind of sounds harsh, doesn't it? But what do we learn in these verses? It, it's one, John is addressing how to deal with false teachers. And then John's words, we've got to remember context, right? How things are said. You know, back in their day, you know, John is saying, have no religious connection with them or with him or the false teacher, nor act towards him so as to induce others to believe you acknowledge him as a brother. I read this uh, this morning. It says, when John says, do not receive him into your house, nor greet, nor greet him, John may be referring most specifically to not allowing these heretical teachers to come into the house where Christians met together. In other words, church, right? And at that time, what did they have? They had home fellowships, right? 
And that, that's the, that was their gatherings. But what is John s- saying? Be watchful. You know, shepherds of God, take care of the sheep. You know, one of the things that I've learned from Pastor Tim is this, is that you guard the pulpit. You guard the pulpit with your life, right? And, and you know, it's like Pastor Tim doesn't let any Tom, Dick, and Harry just come and teach, right? But it's like, no, we've got to know you and so forth. One of my other commentators stated, perhaps, therefore, it is not private hospitality which John is forbidding so much as an ofi- official welcome into the congregation with the opportunity this would afford to the false teachers to propagate his errors. In other words, like I, when we go back to f- home fellowship, it, it's like when we get together, I am not just going to let anybody teach our crew Friday night. You know, it's like, I'm responsible. You know, God allowed us to have the home we live in in Kaneohe and we can have the home to open it up to home fellowship. But even with that, right, to guard it. You know, I have had people come to our door and stuff, and and especially when I live with my parents. It's, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses and others. But when they come to the home, I'm like, the way I look at it is this way, gang. I got to be missionary minded. What do I mean by that? First Peter three fifteen. But sanctify the Lord, your, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, or NIV would say. But do this with gentleness and respect. If they're coming to me and they want to go at it, it's like shoots brought we're on you know and and before I've told you before it's like probably like argue we're going to argue I'm going to win but then I remember coming across 1 Peter 3.15 and it's like okay I'm giving a defense for the hope that's in me ooh I gotta do the gentleness and respect part too you know super important it's like I told you guys a story before where a friend of mine um we had the Jehovah's Witness come to his house, and the lady gave us the Watchtower magazine about why you shouldn't believe in the Trinity. And I had the nerve to, when I was still in college at UH, I went to Hamilton Library. I had the bibliography open to why I shouldn't believe in the Trinity, and I went and I got majority of what was listed on the back of their book. And my friend Kyle and I, we posted all these things, and you know they, they quote the religious encyclopedia of religion and so forth and by the time we met with this lady and we read maybe three four things that they misquoted and we read the whole thing to them that older lady was so upset she slammed her bible shut she grabbed her stuff looked at the younger lady and said we're out of here and she's like I don't need to argue with you because I have the truth. And I'm like, lady, if you ain't willing to fight over stuff, you don't got the truth. But she walked off in a, in a huff, but the second gal, the younger gal, I remember she's looking at us, and you can see that look in her face of going, what? And all I can pray is that we planted some good seeds and that in time, she would come to a saving knowledge of Christ. The other thing, like I just said, about fighting for the faith is Jude 3. For you note takers, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And if you want to write next to contend Earnestly, you can write contend with intensity. In other words, to struggle against, to dispute earnestly, debate. Go for it. Know your Bible. Know Christ. They come to your door. Mission field, baby. Go for it. Our final two verses. 
Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. What do I see in these last couple of verses? Well, I see three things. The first thing I see is John's heart sounds so much like Paul in Romans 1, 11, 12, where Paul writes to the church in Rome, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. For me, that's Friday night. Man, Monday through Thursday, I'm looking Friday. Why? Man, I want to be mutually encouraged with the gang Friday night. You know. But that's Paul. No, that's the apostle. Even John, the apostle. But they're saying, I want to be mutually encouraged. What else do we see? The second thing we see is that John loved his family. He really loved his family. And the third thing, there were other believers who loved them as well. They were all one in Christ. Okay, so in closing, may our love for one another be evident, right? Love is a verb, gang. And may we love and be guided by truth. we got to have that balance. And may we encourage, may we build up, may we help one another in our most holy faith. Okay? Life is over. I fly away to a home on God's celestial shores.
tomorrow brings Lord, I want to close my eyes and meet with you I don't want the little things to slowly weigh me down So show me what I need and what I can live without Lord, I'd rather stand still then face one day all on my own Lord, I want to close my eyes and be with you Whoa, oh, I want to walk by faith Not by fear and not by sight Oh, oh Lord won't you be my strength until I reach the finish line? Oh, I want to be with you when I face the enemy. Oh, Lord, teach me to fight the good fight as if I've never known to feel. Eternity, because I know it won't be long 